Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 21st, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the lead fiscal bills that are emerging in both the House and the Senate. Second, we explain why we likely are a no on the governor's proposed general obligation bond package. And third, we discuss a recent event that reinforces yet again the need for Alaska campaign finance reform. And now, let's join Michael. And now, let's talk about legislative stuff. Their plan has been, I feel like somebody should be like, Snidely should be like twirling his mustache in the background, and uh, as they whisk the the cloth away from their plan, which they've so evilly concocted, uh, give me the rundown here of what we're looking at. Well, I think the uh, the legislature's fiscal plan is emerging uh, in both sides, in the in the House as well as in the Senate. You talked earlier uh, in the opening segment about the Senate side. Uh, they held a hearing yesterday on two bills, SB 199 and SB 200, uh, which provide two alternative alternative ways of dealing with uh, uh, with the PFD. Uh, but both result uh, in substantial cuts. Um, and and the one that Stedman said yesterday, Senator Stedman said yesterday that uh, that he favors uh, 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 he, he the, the goal, according to Senator Bishop, is to get uh, uh, a bill on the body or a bill out of committee by the end of this week uh, and a bill before the on the House on the Senate floor um, uh, next week. Um, they, this, these are bills they just introduced last week. They held a hearing, the first hearing on yesterday. They scheduled public comment yesterday afternoon, uh, and they want to rush them through the committee uh, this week and get them on the floor uh, next week. The one that Senator Seven said he favors is one that would cut the PFD to 25% of POMB as opposed to the governor's proposed 50-50 plan, cut it to uh, 25% of POMB. That matches up, uh, we talked about this, the other bill last week on the House side, uh, HB 259, which is in House Ways and Means. Right. They also pl- plan on voting on it, uh, the, on their bill th- this week uh, on Thursday. It was supposed to be today, uh, but they've moved it to Thursday. Um, and that bill also, <laughs> coincidentally, uh, cuts the PFD to 25% uh, of, uh, of POMB. It does one other thing. It dedicates uh, 50% of the POMB to uh, uh, to education and leaves the remaining 25% for government. Essentially, what they're doing is cutting out of the statutory PFD. They're 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 diverting about 50%, the equivalent of 50% of POMB over to education. Um, but it also cuts the the, the PFD to 25%. So. What you what you see as as you sort of look at this from ten thousand feet is the Senate moving toward Senate finance moving toward a twenty five uh, seventy five uh, uh, PFD uh, twenty five seventy five percent of POMB PFD and you see the House moving toward a twenty five percent PFD twenty five percent of POMB uh, PFD 
and and both of those sort of you know rising in uh, in each body uh, headed toward their floor. Now, you know, it's got to get out of uh, it was got the the PFD's got to get out of uh, the Senate proposals. Got to get out of Senate Finance, right? Uh, and I was I was looking at that last night. Um, the key the interesting votes there are going to be Senator Hoffman, Senator Olson, uh, and Senator Wilson. Uh, what they do. Uh, on uh, on the bill in uh, Senate Finance, and then you know it's going to be it's going to be on the floor, and uh, there will be a, a food fight there, uh, no doubt. House on the House side, the House bill's got to get uh, out of uh, uh, Ways and Means, and then it'll go to House Finance, and then it'll go to the House floor. Y- you were you were talking about this being sort of you know sort of a a, a foolish act or a or a, a useless act, I guess rather. Um, and it is in, in, it is in a couple of ways. I mean, one is, as you pointed out, uh, both those bills just uh, set the PFD in, uh, in, in statute. They both use the word may appropriate, leaving the right. uh, legislature room to, uh, to cut them uh, in subsequent legislatures, even, even the, 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 the already cut uh, version uh, cut them further. Uh, but also, I think you know, they're just headed toward a governor's veto. I mean, the governor has a 50-50 plan. He's running on a 50-50 plan. That's exact. That's a, that's what he said he wants. Uh, he's pushing it hard. It's an election year. Uh, he's already cut the PFD uh, to get it down to POMV 50-50. He's already proposing to cut the statutory PFD by a significant amount, 25% uh, over the course of uh, the next decade. Um, so I, 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 I don't see the governor... Uh, uh, signing a bill that would come up with uh, with twenty five seventy five, so this is really just a messaging exercise. It seems uh, from the legislature that uh, on the House side that you know we're, we support education and we, we support it so much that we're going to you know cut the PFD and dedicate designate a portion of it to uh, to uh, education, uh, and on the Senate side, you know whatever message they're trying to send right. that they think twenty five to seventy five is appropriate, but. It's uh, that's that's what they're moving toward. Um, but as I say, in the end, you know, even if they both pass the bills, even if they got on the same page at twenty five seventy five, which appears to be what the leadership is trying to trying to merge toward, um, you know, I, at the end, I think the governor vetoes it. And there's not there's certainly not enough votes to uh, override the veto. So. We're spending a lot of time on something that isn't going anywhere. <laughs> well, uh, another an, another great legislature. Let me let me say some of the messages. I mean, you said this is a messaging exercise. And as I said earlier in the monologue that, you know, the bottom line is, is that these are all statutory changes, which they can ignore at their whim anyway. That's the main problem. That's been the main problem. But let me tell you some of the things <clears throat> that uh, that I got messages on. First and foremost, the messaging of. We really kind of, when I said that they whisked the, the 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 sheet away to show it, you know, at the last minute, that's exactly what it was. I mean, this thing came out like, what, Thursday they announced it, and then boom, they're having it. So they short shrifted the notice. They didn't tell anybody about it. They didn't give anybody. But people still showed up. People still testified. And uh, even KTUU's reporting that there was frustration from Alaskans who called into the committee on Monday. Many called in to support the 1982 PFD formula, the statutory formula which hasn't been followed since 2015, it would pay a dividend of over $4,200 in 2022. Then the other message that I got was, of course, from Bert Stedman, who just said, that's just fantasy land. That's beyond fantasy land. It's hallucinations with LSD. This is the disdain that these lawmakers hold for the public who they are ostensibly representing. I mean, they have heard this in meeting after meeting. This is Andy Josephson's uh, commentary. It's it's just the same thing writ large from last session when Andy Josephson got up after what it was a four hours of testimony, ninety six percent in favor of paying a statutory PFD, and he basically told everybody pretty politely, but he told them to all go pound sand because they just didn't understand. And this is the same messaging we're getting here from Stedman. Oh, that's just fantasy land. We couldn't possibly do that. Oh, you could. You just don't have the will to do it. And I think. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing that this whole thing is preordained in their mind. Yeah, we've got three forces at work, right? We've got we've got the PFD. We want to we want to pay you know from from those who want to pay a full PFD. We've got those who you know don't want to cut government, 
And and that's pretty strong. I mean, the governor tried it in 2019, and he couldn't even get 16 in the legislature to to support him at the levels that he was trying to cut it to. And he's since given up. Heck, the governor's growing government now. The, you know, he's announced that he wants to expand the WAM. He used to want to cut the WAMI program. Now he wants to expand the WAMI program. So the government, the governor's now growing government. Um, and the third is the the no taxes side. I mean, if if you're not going to cut government, you've got to come up with revenues. Um, and and then. And the and then the debate is between revenues on the on on the tax side or revenues on the PFD cut, cut side, uh, and and Bert and Natasha and and others in the top twenty percent certainly don't want to uh, don't want to pay taxes, so they want to push it down on middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, through PFD cuts. But those are the three forces, and when Bert tells you that you know it's fantasy land to pay out a statutory PFD, what he's telling you is I'm not going to cut government obviously, and I'm not going to do taxes to raise the money so it's got to come from someplace right and it's going to come you know in, in, in my mind it's going to come from middle and lower income alaska families through uh through pfd cuts it's yeah that's i'm that's that's the message and 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 there's a cons i mean they've, they've been consistent in that message we're not going to raise taxes we're not going to we're not going to reduce government and so there you go you know we got the pfd we got control over it it comes through our fingers and guess what we got sticky fingers and we're going to hang on to a bunch of it uh, on its on its way through we know better than you you poor poor pitiful children how to run this and you should just shut up and let your betters do what needs to be done i mean that's essentially the yeah. messaging yeah and and they're trying i mean they're trying to enlist allies right i mean this whole thing over on the house side about designating a portion of what used to go to the pfd substantial portion of what used to go to the pfd uh, now to education is to try to reel in K through 12 and frankly, local government. I mean, one of the things that really surprised me last week uh, was AML, the, the, the Alaska Municipal League, uh, the association of, of mayors and borough uh, presidents and, 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 and what have you around, uh, around the state uh, had their annual meeting and they had Ivy Sponholtz uh, talk about the house bill, the, the 2575, uh, her 2575 bill with, you know, 50% of the 75 going to, uh, going to K through 12, they had her uh, address the, address the body and there was support, great support, uh, for Ivy's bill. So they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to buy off constituencies, if you will, by taking the PFD and saying, oh, we're going to designate it to K through 12. Local government loves that because that firms up uh, the, the, the cash flow or the, the revenue flow into, uh, into schools. And so, you know, local government has to worry less about coming up with funding, uh, uh funding for, uh, its share of, uh, or more than its share, uh, of schools. And so it's just, I mean, every, everybody views the PFD as a pot of, or the legislators view of the PFD as a pot of money that, that, you know, they get to, they get to run with now. And, um, and 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 they're trying to enlist uh, allies as they go. Yeah, we'll see how successful they are. I mean, like you said, I mean, they're, it's all headed for veto land. I would agree with that. If the governor does not veto this, he's do <laughs> he's DOA come election day. I'll be honest with you. I think that'll be the that'll be the final straw for many who still ostensibly support him. He's got to stand strong in this, and especially when he can look and see that uh, that th that there is no uh, there's no ability for them to override that veto. Um, yeah, he, I don't, I, I don't know if it gets out of the Senate, frankly. Uh, I mean, that'll be an interesting vote. Um, uh, it'll be an interesting vote, whether, you know, how it, how it deals well, with, surprisingly, uh, with the house. You, surprisingly enough, it looked like Natasha von Imhoff wasn't even really thrilled with either one of these, which was surprising. Well, she does. Yeah. She doesn't want anything to go to the PFD. I yeah. mean, if you fix it at 25% and if you believe that they're really going to pay the 25%, uh, you, you really can't grow government <laughs> right. um, any further, and so at some point there, you 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 it escalates or or advances the time when there's finally the face off between those who want to grow government and those who have would have to pay taxes for the uh, for the additional cost. So she doesn't want any PFD. She just she <laughs> wants it. She wants it as the leftover. Yeah, that's true. That's true, Brad. The thing that just leaped out at me, and I I am going to go soundbite this. I didn't get a chance because I only read about this late last night, early this morning, as I was doing some show prep. <laughs> Um, was this this commentary again by by uh, Bert Stedman? I mean, just the disdain of 
how dare you people call into this committee and tell us that we should be following the statute because that's just fantasy. It's 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 beyond fantasy. It's hallucinations with LSD. You're all drug users. I mean, you monkeys trying to do all this kind of stuff. I mean, this is the kind of language this guy uses, and yet he still continues to go back. But this, I think, is just the, uh, again, the plain arrogance of the legislature writ large. Well, he's trying to sell a product, and the product is, I can't, I, I'm not going to cut spending I don't, I don't want to tax. I'm not going to tax. Uh, and so I've got to cut your PFD and, and look at all these. I, they had a presentation yesterday from legislative finance and I, I respect legislative finance. I think they do a good job uh, uh, in with, with, you know, sort of within the, the box that, uh, that they're, that's drawn for them. Uh, but they had a, a, a presentation yesterday from legislative finance, which was geared toward one thing proving that you couldn't run government uh, and pay uh, not even not not only not a statutory PFD, but not even a POMV uh, 50, uh, 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 50, 50, 50 PFD. And, you know, and, and, and you can you, if you draw enough lines, you draw, you know, spending continuing escalated uh, by inflation and you and they're using the old, they're using the spring, the re, the fall uh, revenue forecast. The Dunleavy administration has come out when they did their amendments uh, last week. They came out with a new revenue forecast. But uh, Senate finance and, and legislative finance are still using the old, the fall revenue forecast, substantially lower in terms of oil prices right? Um, than, than what the market tells us now. If, if you use, you know, if you rig the numbers enough, <laughs> you can... <laughs> You 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 come up with a with a with a conclusive pitch that you have to you have to cut the PFD you have to cut it by a huge amount, um, and so that's I mean so Bert's trying to sell that product he's trying to sell the 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 product that he's had legislative finance build for him. Well, that's true. Um, again, I think it's just uh, again indicative of the politician's disease. Um, quickly here, since we're in the break and we got about three minutes, um, your thoughts on the fact that Natasha dropped out last week, that happened, uh, that happened after we had a chance to converse Natasha saying she's stepping back. Um, and I'm hearing rumors that, uh, this could be part of a broader stroke where you're going to see maybe even Machiki step back and maybe they'd make another run here in four more years. What, what, what's your thoughts on, on this, uh, stepping out now as we see it? Well, I, I, I've got to say, you know, she's got a personal story that 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 needs some respect. Her father passed away of cancer. Absolutely. Uh, her her husband has cancer um, uh, and uh, is is not in the best of health. She has kids uh, that are still young uh, at home uh, and with uh, with her husband uh, uh, ill. I mean, there's there's a personal story sure. there that, uh, that that you have to respect. Um, <laughs> I, I i'm 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 a I, before there may be another side of the story let's try it this way there may be some polling i mean if anybody's got the money to do polling it'd be natasha and there may be some uh some some polling that got done that that indicated it was going to be it wasn't going to be a smooth race how about that <laughs> um and, and with uh with uh with the uh with the personal side of it um uh, you know, it, it, people telling you you need to be home. You should be home, taking taking care of your family. Polling's telling you maybe it's not going to be that easy a ride. Um, right. I can I can see where she stepped back. I'm a little surprised she also stepped back from the reelection campaign, although that was going to be hard also with Mia. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, no. uh, in the same district. So absolutely no. But I, but but we but we have to we have to respect the personal story. No, I and and I, and I will say that that as much as I dislike her politics, um, I would wish those kind of circumstances on no one. Uh, the death of her father and the illness of her husband, um, you know, and and like I said, I could definitely understand pulling the plug for those reasons alone. Uh, and my thoughts, you know, my thoughts and prayers go out to her family on that. That's tough stuff. But at the same time, I'm also you know the political animal in me is twisting and turning and trying to see if there's some. Uh, advantage in that regard, uh, simply because that's the game that we're in, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, and I hope that I hope it's for a speedy recovery. But at the same time, um, you know, I just wonder where it goes from here. That's always my question. Um, we are, yeah, well, you know, John, 
Go ahead. John Binkley tried to come back. John Binkley tried to come back uh, and run for governor after he'd been out of uh, the Senate for a while. And that didn't go too well. But, yeah. you know, maybe that's what she's trying to do. Yeah, maybe, possibly. I guess we'll, we'll see how it goes uh, on that. Uh, Brad, quick tease for number two. Well, number two is uh, uh, the bond bill. I mean, Governor Dunleavy, in addition to talking about uh, POMV 5050 uh, uh, last week or the week before, uh, has proposed a, a, a general obligation bond. Uh, uh, and, uh, and yesterday or the day before, that was probably yesterday since that was Monday, Mayor Bronson uh, of Anchorage uh, came out uh, in favor of the GO bond bill. I don't think it's a great idea, and uh, and so I'm going to talk about why I'm uh, I, I I'm I'm likely going to be a no if the bond bill got through the legislature. Let's talk about number two of the weekly top three, which is the governor's plan and suggestion that what we really need to do for all these capital projects, 350 plus million dollars worth, is we need to bond for them, meaning we need to borrow the money because inflation rates are low, or interest uh, inflation rates are low, interest rates are low. And uh, we could use that money to help pay and fluff out a PFD and everything else. And, I mean, I think this may be DOA, but give me your thoughts on this, Brad, here as we move forward. Well, I think this is I think this uh, an election move uh, on the governor's part to uh, to, uh, uh, you know, float a bond package and to say, you know, it's sort of. It's sort of his equivalent of uh, Representative Sponholtz's move to get K through 12 on board. Uh, with uh, with PFD cuts by saying I'm going to designate a portion of uh, the PFD to uh, to K through 12, uh, the governor is out there saying you know I'm trying to you know I'm going to build good jobs and and, and you know, strong jobs by by this construction budget, uh, and I've got plans to spend it you know all over the state because that's what you do with a general obligation bond you try to you know do a lot of stuff uh, uh, to get uh, various votes uh, with it. And I think I think he's trying to to uh, to show that he's a you know he wants to he's a leader in the sense that he's got he's got ideas about uh, about uh, where to where to build the state. Mayor Bronson's on board because you know they're facing a huge bill for a six hundred million dollar bill for you know rebuilding the port of Anchorage, port of Alaska, um, and, and you know helping get uh, to pay right. for that so that he doesn't have to you know come up with a package on his own. Uh, and uh, and it is supporting uh, the governor's proposal for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for for this general obligation bond. From my perspective, we got about a billion dollars of federal uh, uh, capital budget coming into the state in various forms. Some of it coming through the state, some of it going direct uh, through grants uh, for broadband uh, uh, and and other things uh, throughout the state. Uh, we've got a heck of a lot of construction money uh, uh, coming into the state. Um, and frankly, I don't think we need to uh, be pouring more money uh, on top of that. We may need to keep our powder dry uh, uh, once the federal money runs out, keep our powder dry for maybe having a general obligation bond at that point. Just, you know, just just spending more so that somebody can have it as a campaign theme. Uh, I think is uh, I think is uh, not a good idea for having a general obligation bond. The other the other thing is we're not out of the fiscal woods at all. Uh, I mean, Mary, Mayor Bronson in his uh, in his op ed uh, says, well, you know, we got a balanced budget for the. We don't have a balanced budget. The only reason we've got a balanced budget uh, uh, this year is because the governor's taking about a billion dollars <laughs> from the statutory PFD and moving it into government. Uh, by by going from statutory PFD down to POMV 5050, and over the 10-year period, he's taking that that proposal to go from the statutory PFD down to POMV 5050 is about an average of 700 million dollars per year. The only reason that the governor's budget looks like it balances is because he's you know cutting the PFD and diverting a portion of it uh, to government. If we if for those who think that we still need to be talking about a statutory PFD. We don't have a balanced budget, and we shouldn't be spending any more. Uh, and we should be, you know, getting our fiscal house in order by, by controlling at, at least controlling our costs, not not adding to them. So I think I think it's we we don't need the additional injection of capital money right now. The federal government, I mean, for good, bad, or indifferent, it's coming from the federal government. We're getting an injection from them. I don't think we need the injection of additional money. 
uh, to uh, you know to keep capital projects going, to keep uh, uh, construction jobs uh, jobs going. I don't think that's a good reason for it. I think that you know because we have all this federal money in, we need to keep our powder dry for maybe uh, a need for injecting additional construction money into the state down the road. We shouldn't be using up our bonding capacity now uh, when we may need it down the road. And third, I don't think we can afford it. I mean, we've still got, we're still running deficits. If you, uh, if you count the statutory PFD or if oil prices go back down. Right. Uh, and, and I don't think we ought to be adding additional costs. I, you know, it's the same thing. It's the same concerns I have with the governor's expansion of the whammy program. I mean, three years ago, four years ago, 29, 2019, what, three years ago, three years ago, the governor was trying to, with with you know my support and other support, the governor was trying to end the whammy program, uh, which is you know the the uh, the Alaska subsidizing medical students uh, uh, program. Um, the governor was trying to end the whammy program. Now he's he's wanting, proposing to increase the whammy program by fifty percent. If we we're we're in no better fiscal shape now than we were uh, uh, three years ago, and you know and and to be proposing to expand the whammy program I, all the governor's trying to do is 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 you know get votes by by showing that you know he now he's gonna he can spend money with the best of them right so and i the, the the bond package falls in the same category for me he's just trying to get votes by showing that he can spend money by trying to appeal to certain sectors of the state that would get the capital money certain uh, sectors of the economy that would that would get funded by the capital projects um, and uh, and I don't think I don't think we, it's either needed in terms of generating additional capital spending in the state uh, or uh, or it's, it's can afford. Well, and I think the the bigger problem is if you look at it just from a, like a household budget standpoint, you don't go out and borrow a bunch of money when you're already fiscally struggling, even if it uh, gives you something nice and shiny in the short term. Uh, you may need, as you said earlier, keeping your powder dry. You may need that in your pocket later on if you have to borrow for some kind of emergency need uh, or, as you said, when the uh, federal money dries up and is gone. I mean, this federal money is only going to affect us this year and maybe next year. And then after that, it's it's really there's no guarantees of anything. Uh, and you may need that uh, somewhere down the road. Yeah, it's, the federal money will be over the next five years. I mean, the capital spending is over the next five years. So we, so it'll be coming through. It'll be floating through for the next five years. And I, you know, I think that's a. I think it's a. a, a, a it's something we have to take into account. Whether, you know, you or I would have voted for the federal for that federal spending. I, you know, it's a debate we can have. But but the fact is, it's coming. The fact is, it's going to float through the. Flu- float through the state and uh, and something that uh, that I think we need to take into account. You, you know, you're talking about building brand new shiny more brand new shiny things. Heck, we can't even fund the deferred maintenance on the on the things we built, <laughs> built in the past and none of none of the GO budget, none of the GO bond goes to, you know, funding deferred maintenance. It's all to build additional new uh, uh, shiny things. So right. it's I I understand why he's doing it politically. I mean, it's it's election time and you always want to be out there you know, I'm pro growth. I look at this, you know, I'm going to build new stuff in your part of the state and I'm going to employ all these people. Uh, but it's, it's not needed in terms of capital funding because we got the feds government coming in and it's, it's nothing we can afford. Um, uh, if we're still, if, if you're still thinking about the statutory PFD sort of being the baseline. Brief synopsis in number three, and then we can take it over the break. Yep. Uh, another uh, another uh, campaign reform issue uh, surfaced last week. The Republican Governors Association put three million dollars uh, toward the governor's uh, toward a gubernatorial campaign this coming year. Uh, they did it in a way that enables them to, you know, uh, shield uh, who is doing it. It's another reason to me, another reason that we need to be looking at, uh, at campaign finance reform, and another reason that whatever elections bill Mike Shower is working on that comes out of state Senate affairs, an important part of that bill, elections reform, needs to be campaign finance reform. We don't need dark money uh, or, or big globs of money running this state. We need Alaskans to be uh, deciding who uh, who governs Alaska, not, uh, not outsiders. Oh, wait a minute. I thought that uh, ballot measure number two done fixed that. I thought ballot measure number two said no more dark money into the state. Uh, 
Maybe I was confused. Maybe it got lost in that 36 pages of instructions in the voter manual for ballot measurement. Maybe I missed that. Uh, but that's what the ad said for sure. It's troubling to see, you know, ostensibly one of the reasons why they did all this was, of course, to protect us from dark money. Um, but the bottom line is, is that they left some large gaping holes in there uh, really to help themselves. And, and we're just seeing the first group of Republicans take advantage of it. Well, it's so this one, this one sort of skated the this one sort of skated the rules in this way. The, the 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 rules from ballot measure one, the rules that set uh, set the dark money rules, the disclosure rules, took effect on a certain day uh, in uh, whatever year they took effect last year, and the Republican money came in ahead of that, like six days ahead before the before the new rules went into effect requiring the disclosure. If the Republican money came in today. It would have uh, it would have required it, it would have met the disclosure rules, but all that means is that it would have that they would have had to disclose the source of the funds to the RGA, if there were corporations or if there were, you know, various individuals that gave that money that the RGA then gave in block to uh, to Alaska for the Alaska race, then they would have had to disclose it. It doesn't ballot measure one doesn't restrict the amount of money coming into the state. Now we've got, you know, we've got issues with, uh, uh, with the Supreme court decision, uh, through Supreme court decisions that, you know, talk about the first amendment rights to give money. Um, and there are limitations with that, but there are limitations on what we can do with that, but we ought to be pursuing, um, uh, lim- whatever limitations we can do to keep uh, uh, huge blocks of money, uh, outside money coming into the state, trying to influence our elections. Uh, the three million dollars that the RGA just threw into the race exceeded the amount that all seven uh, uh, current gubernatorial candidates were able to raise on their own uh, uh, in the in 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 the reporting period. I mean, it just wiped away everything that uh, that the that the candidates had raised, and I and I fear that that's going to continue. Uh, not only through this election, not only on the state side in this election cycle, but certainly on the federal side because of the Lisa race. Uh, I fear that we're just going to continue to have globs of outside money coming in. As you've said before, and as I agree, Alaska is a cheap date. You can pour a lot of money into Alaska. You can pour a little bit of a money into Alaska and have a big effect because of right. uh, because of how our media markets operate. And uh, and you know, a Senate seat is a huge deal. A governor's seat is a huge deal. Governor's seat in a resource state is a huge deal. There are people that want to buy, you know, those seats. They want they want to make sure that they have their person uh, in uh, in in those seats to control, uh, uh, you know, things that are important to them. And I, you know, I, people ought to be able to give money. I've given money in the past. I'll give money in the future. People ought to be able to give money, but we ought not to let you know big money interests just dominate. Uh, uh, the uh, the 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 election cycle by you know overwhelming the Alaska market with uh, with outside money. Yeah, no, I think it's problematic to say the least. Um, and again, you're right. And that wasn't me that said it was a cheap date. That was one of the people that donated a big chunk of that seven million dollars to ballot measure number two. I've forgotten her name. One of the millionaires that's behind this whole thing. They're they're trying to go state to state, and and they basically said. They basically admitted in uh, in some of the leaked stuff that uh, Alaska was a test bed and that Alaska was a cheap date. And you're right. You only have to spread a few million dollars around in a state like this, where if you went to a state like, you know, uh, well, I mean, even Connecticut or New York, I mean, any of those places, it would be tens of millions of dollars to try and move the needle as much as they were able to move the needle with just seven million dollars is what the ballot measure two people had. And so it just proves it again and again that that's where we're at. Yeah, and you get a Senate seat for that, right? I mean, we we see how important in a 50-50 Senate, even if, you know, even if it moves the needle, the next election moves the needle a little bit, 52-48 one way or the other. We've seen how important a Senate seat is nationally. And and so right. you can come up here and essentially buy a Senate seat by pushing a bunch of money uh into the state. You can buy a governor's uh uh seat uh that controls a huge amount of access to resources up here. Yeah, has has significant environmental issues. I mean, either side. It's not it's not just the Republicans that are doing this. It's the Democrats. 
the progressives uh, that are doing this. We need to we need to we need to tamp down on the ability of outsiders. Now, outsiders have a legitimate interest in 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 how Alaska develops things, um, and and they ought to be able to express that through dollars as well as Alaskans. Uh, but we ought not to have a system where outsiders can bring in huge amount of dollars. What's huge amount a huge amount of, to us? a huge amount of dollars and, and significantly influence our races. We ought to make yeah. sure that Alaskans continue to control Alaska races. That to me is as, is as important an election issue as anything else Mike Shower is considering uh, in state Senate affairs, ballot security, election security, all of that's important, but controlling the amount of money that comes into this state, the amount of money that is, is spent to influence our elections, either side, Republican or Democrat, is is to me as much an elections issue as anything else that uh, Senator Shower is looking at. <laughs> if it comes out of state affairs, and that's a big if right now, boy, I tell you what, they don't want to see that thing go anywhere right now. So uh, anyway, uh, Brad, thank you as always uh, for your uh, for your thoughtful analysis on this. I appreciate you coming on board, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again next week. Thanks for being part of it. Michael, as always, uh, as always thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keefley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.